we welcome you to another of our ongoing discussions on the Old Testament. My name is Paul Hoskison, and I teach in the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU. And I'm joined today by three of my colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture. To my left, D. Kelly Ogden. Across the table from me, Eric Huntsman. And to my right, Michael Rhodes. Welcome. I'm glad to have you join me this day. In a previous session, we discussed the Psalms in general and Hebrew poetry. In this session, we will be talking about the Messianic Psalms in particular. Now, as Latter-day Saints, we en enjoy reading the Psalms and we enjoy seeing Christ in the Psalms. And there are a lot of them that do, and we will cover as many as we can today. But often the question is asked why other people don't see Christ in the Psalms. Uh, Eric, do you, would you like to say something well, you about know, I that? I would say, you know, in particular, our Jewish friends who've had the Psalter a lot longer than we have, they have seen meaning in the same Psalms that we see as being about Jesus Christ. And a lot of times as you look at commentators, they'll call what we call Messianic Psalms, royal Psalms. And they'll claim that these were written for the king when he was crowned, they were sung at his coronation, or perhaps at important events like a royal wedding. And so this really isn't about Jesus Christ or some future Messiah. This is about the king that they encountered day to day. Uh, of course, what we need to remember is that the king was intended to be a type of Jesus Christ. Um, a Messiah is simply someone who's anointed. The kings, the priests, most prophets were anointed. And so the king was supposed to point the people to Christ by the way he lived. Now, of course, most of them didn't do that. We only have a handful, Josiah, Hezekiah, of, of good kings. But for instance, the second psalm in the Psalter, in our, in our collection of psalms, our heading names it as a messianic psalm. Starts out familiarly, why do the heathen rage? Why are all these people taking, account, uh, uh, taking counsel against the Lord and his anointed? And we immediately see the Christ in that. But for instance, in verse 7, where it says, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Some scholars, or perhaps people of other traditions, would say, well, the king of Judah, when he was crowned, the Jehovah symbolically adopted him that day. He became his son. But I think the point is, it's not that they're completely wrong. They're just missing the typology of that. They're, they're missing what that represents. It's not just a royal psalm. It's much more than that. Right. If it's a royal psalm, it's because the king was supposed to represent Christ. Yes. And by what he did for his people, defending them in battle, caring for them, taking care of the poor and the afflicted, he was supposed to be a foreshadow of what Christ himself was going to do. The, the word Christ, by the way, that's the Greek term Christos, for meaning the, uh, the anointed Mashiach, one. Messiah is right. the Hebrew term. The reason these are called messianic, to use the adjective, is because they do point to the Messiah, the, who we understand is Jesus of Nazareth. Right. Uh, by the way, the reason this book, the Psalms, is the most quoted book in the New Testament is because <laughs> it refers to him right. as much as any other source. I, I, uh, one uh, incident from the New Testament, you remember where the two disciples are walking along on the road to Emmaus? Mm -hmm. Jesus opened up the scriptures to their understanding and they felt their hearts burning. There was something happening spiritually. But one line, this is Luke 24, 44 says, He said unto them, the Savior, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses the Torah, mm -hmm. the books of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Three Concerning parts of the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible is divided in those three parts. But he, he singles out. See, the law is a number of books. The uh, prophets, all the historical books and the prophets, that's another section, but he singles out one right. by representing the, the literary book work. It's all by itself. As the work that uh, shows him, and there's so much said about him specifically. Well, just Thank quickly you. to look at two other of these royal psalms that are messianic, and that will launch us into our discussions of them. Psalm by the way, we need to mention that, that the concept of anointing, which is where the term Messiah comes from, uh, the kings were anointed Absolutely. in those days, and so that's a prefiguring also of the anointed one <clears throat> who comes in the meridian of time. For instance, in 89, 20 and 21, it says, I have found David my servant with my holy oil, I have anointed him. That follows exactly what you're saying, Paul, with whom my hand shall be established. Verse 28, my mercy 
and it will keep him forevermore. My covenant will stand fast for him. Uh, this is the Davidic covenant. David was the first one in this family to be a type of Christ. He was promised that there would always be a righteous king in his line. Now, eventually, as long as they were righteous, as long as they were righteous, and they fail at that, but because Jesus would be the son of David. This ultimate application applies. Verses 35, once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever. In Psalm 132, um, we've, we, found, we see some of these same things. The Lord has swore, sworn unto David, verse 11, of the fruit of thy body will I set it upon thy throne. This is talking about Jesus. And so we can understand how other people may look at these and say, oh, it has a historical application or just a Davidic application. But we see the deeper meaning, and, and that's why they're so important to us. Thank you. Let's see if we, how many of these psalms we can get through in the time that we have left. Let's turn to, first to Psalm 8. Kelly, would you like to talk about Psalm 8? Psalm 8 is labeled as a messianic psalm. Uh, a, a good expression to describe this psalm is... <coughs> How great thou art. <laughs> we could break for example, in verse 3, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, hast crowned him with glory and honor. That uh, title has been used even a little lower than the angels, but that isn't what the Hebrew text says. The Hebrew says, v'techasrehu me'at me'elohim. It says literally, thou hast made him to lack a little, just a little, of God. Pointing to that topic, you know, we have in our topical guide, man, comma, potential to become Be like. like Heavenly Father. That, that yes, we're, we're so little and obscure in this great cosmos the, the Lord has set in motion out there, but hey, we're just a little shy of God himself. If we'll put our hand in his hand, he can lead us right back to become as he is. Very good. Let's turn to one of the most, one of the longest and the most detailed of all messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, and it's Psalm 22. Uh, Christ on the cross quotes uh, actually the opening line of Psalm 22 in Matthew 27, 46. And uh, I believe that the people standing at the foot of the cross would have recognized that he was quoting the first verse of uh, Psalm 22 and would have uh, looked around them and said, wow, Psalm 22 is unfolding before our very eyes. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are watching my God, my Psalm God, 22. My, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it, it describes in some detail many of the happenings in the last 24 hours of Christ's life. Uh, for instance, uh, the, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, which he says on the cross. Let's turn to some of the more uh, specific ones. Uh, I'd like to mention verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of men. This is a description of Messiah that reminds us a lot of Isaiah 53, the suffering it's Messiah. Suffering. Right. Uh, and, and it's in that same vein that it is given here, but the, the psalmist has given it a double meaning besides that because the word worm here is the word for a little grub that grows in that part of the world from which the color scarlet comes. Oh, so and, and, and therefore this is, uh, uh, they esteem me as this little grub, but actually I am the source for royalty. I am royalty. Mm -hmm. And uh, they reproach me, but I am the king. I am the anointed well, one. Well, just like you don't see the scarlet with the grub, they don't see it with the earthly That's Jesus, right. but the resurrected and glorified Jesus yes. will be like the scarlet the worm produces. And it's not by accident then that one of the gospels mentions the scarlet robe that the soldiers put on Jesus. Right. Uh, in verse seven, this is literally fulfilled again in, in the New Testament. And they, sh they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And, and there's a wonderful thing here in verse 9 about uh, um, Christ's calling, too. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts, and I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. The Lord has been with Jesus from the very beginning. Uh, verse 16 is, is particularly... Uh, 
applicable to Christ. They pierced my hands, hands and, and my feet. feet. Uh, yes. Uh, or the verses before that talk about the pains on the cross. cross. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. But look at 14. I am poured out like water. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of me. And, and I can't help think of John 19:34. such a powerful image that after the, the Savior died on the cross and they pierced his side out yes. came blood and water, you know, representing his mortality but also his divinity. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the, the metaphor here of extreme thirst, which is mentioned, of course, uh, sure. in the Gospels of right. Jesus Christ on the cross. It's Verse uh, 17, we've already mentioned some like that. Right. I may till all my bones. Till is a, a wonderful English word the, that means to count. I may count all my bones. That is, none of them are broken. They're all there. They're all whole and so on. Which is the image of the, the Paschal Lamb, right? Yes, the, the image of the Paschal Lamb. And in verse 18, what, uh, again, something that literally happens at the foot of the cross, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture and so forth. So the question is, it, he <coughs> has inspired psalmists. A thousand years before, he has inspired them to write down words that he will actually utter. A thousand years later, he's quoting words that, that he they, inspired, that he inspired them, to them to write down that he would so later quote. he's not quote. really quoting them, <laughs> so he's quoting, quoting himself. himself. Exactly. Yes. I'd like to go on a little bit in this verse, verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Uh, there's some trouble with Hebrew text there, but <laughs> what, what is going on here is that uh, uh, Christ is saying, basically, you know, this is pretty tough, Lord. So uh, I'm not afraid to die. Let's go through with this, but uh, let's not leave it at death. Let's, let's keep this going. So in verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I'll praise thee. That is after his death on the cross, he does declare his name in the congregation and the spirit world. And ye that fear the Lord, praise him and so on and so forth. And, and finally, we get down near the end, uh, verse 28. Well, well let's, let's do 27 first. 27, all right. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. That ultimately the result of, of what's happened before will be the salvation of mankind. Yes, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among, all the, among the nations, and so forth. And um, at the end of verse 29, and none can keep alive his own soul, that is, nobody can save themselves. It's only through the Savior Jesus Christ that we become saved. And a seed shall serve him. Isaiah asks, where is his seed? Well, it, Abinadi there, tells us. And Abinadi tells us. <laughs> it, here, and here it is also, a seed shall serve him. Those are the people who, who, the prophets, who, those have, accepted who have accepted him. him and so on. And it shall be counted to the Lord for generation. These are all the, those who are called by his name. And they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. That is, those who are born into the celestial kingdom. Mm. A beautiful and long. We could spend the whole hour on, on Psalm 22. Let's go on to uh, uh, Psalms 31 and 34. Kelly, would you like to say something? 31, uh, for example, verse 5. There's another very famous line. He uh -huh. actually spoke on the cross, into thy hand I commit my spirit. Luke 23. And uh, 34, 20. He keepeth all his bones. We've already mentioned this. Not one of them is broken. He is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, and not one bone would be broken. All of these things. <clears throat> Not, not only the other prophets, like Moses uh, prophesied things about him raising up a serpent on a staff, and he recorded that uh, Jacob uh, promised a scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. That's a prophecy of the Messiah. And then... Um, uh, By the way, one of the early uh, Jewish commentators uh, says Shiloh is another word for the Messiah. Yeah. Yes. But so, so from Moses all the way down through all the prophets, even Micah and other prophets, of course, knew that he would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, we're seeing that every little detail is yes. going to be fulfilled. And in the Psalms, we have so many specific details, uh, words actually uttered during the last hours of his life. You, you, uh, this is a good segue into Psalm 69, where we have two more sayings that, uh, that have to do with the Savior during this time. Let's start with verse 9. Michael, would you read that for us? Yeah. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, quoted by uh, Matthew. Or John, who's cleansing of the temple, isn't it? Yeah. John yes. 2. And 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar, vinegar to drink. drink. 
down Very to the, interesting. the minutest detail. Well, and these details the almost don't make sense in the context. No. We don't have an example of anyone force feeding David vinegar, you know, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> anyone, I'm impressed with anyone really searching through what we call the Old Testament, this is the Hebrew Bible, through the prophets and through the psalmists, how they could not see the fulfillment in every one of these details in one person, and one person only. Yes. Well, like I said, there's some things, the royal psalms, they can kind of explain. explain but away. when we start to put all these other details, there's nothing that explains all of them. Right. Except him. Yeah, well, that's right. There is one, only one, that explains all of them. Thank Let's you. Turn to for Psalm 110. This is one of the ones uh, that the Lord uses in the New Testament. Uh, uh, often in the New Testament, Christ was asked a trick question. That is, they tried to trap him with a question. And on at least one occasion, the Lord turns the tables on them and says, let me ask you something. And he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then Christ asks them, how can David call the Messiah uh, um, my Lord? That just doesn't work. Uh, and, and they can't answer him. They don't have an answer for him. So let's analyze this, what, exactly what is going on in verse 1. Uh, uh, paraphrasing a bit here, and God said to my Lord, that is David's Lord, and this has to be the Messiah, that's what it's referring to, that is, and God said to the Messiah, who is David's Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well, how is it possible that David would refer, who is writing the psalm, to the Messiah, who is supposed to be one of his sons, <coughs> grandsons, great-grandsons, uh, how does he refer to him as my Lord? You know, th that isn't what happens. What normally happens is that the, the children refer to their father as my Lord. Right. The father doesn't refer to the children as my Lord. And, and uh, what the Savior is bringing out in the New Testament here by quoting Psalm 110 is that they don't really understand or they don't want to admit who the Messiah is. Right. That is, he's not just the son of David, because if he were just the son of David, then it wouldn't make any sense for David to call him my Lord. You don't call your great, 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 great grandson your Lord. Lord, Lord. <laughs> but David does call him yes, the Messiah, his Lord, because he's not just the son, he's also the son of God. And therefore, he is David's Lord because he's the son of God. Well, the same chapter has another very famous passage. Um, this is Psalm 110, 4 and 5. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. He's not going to change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings. Um, the Maccabees, the priestly family that rebelled against the, the Syrians, tried to make a lot out of this. They were priests, and eventually they usurped the crown, and for a while they were kings and priests, a and nice lowly, combination. Lowly priests. These lowly were not priests. even the, the they, higher level They of kind priests. of took over and became high priest and took, you know, assumed the title of king, and so they were going to be the kings and priests. But we know from the book of Hebrews there's something else going on here. In chapter 7, Hebrews teaches us about the relationship of Abraham and Melchizedek and the priesthood and these ordinances, and it's all connected. And Psalm 110.4 is actually qu quoted in verse 17 of Hebrews 7. He testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That Jesus had a priesthood that was beyond anything that the Mosaic order had. It wasn't just a Levitical or Aaronic priesthood. And Jesus is a king and priest, right? Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. Uh, it's just well, very powerful. His, his name, the Melchizedek. Melchizedek is uh, likely a name title for right, this yes. person, which means king of righteousness. Well, he's a type because the king of righteousness is the Savior. Yes. So you're a priest after the order of no. the Son of God. Right, yes. Which, which, which is, is the, the original in, title in of the priest. chapter 13. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. high priests Great are, power. in fact, a, a type of. of uh, and I think Christ. we make the mistake sometimes when we think that the the Melchizedek priesthood, the, the priesthood after the order of the Son of God, is named after a mortal, the Melchizedek who lived in the days of, of Abraham. It's the other way around. The Melchizedek in the days of Abraham is named after the Son of God, as you, as you point yes, out there, Kelly. Yes. And that's, why, that's what this means here in this passage. Thou, the Messiah, Christ, art a priest for, uh, forever after the order of the of my king of righteousness who is the son the of son god, of god. Yes. Comes, so that's the actual title it's the yes. order after the, that's right. 
yes. the Son of God. Very good, very interesting. Let's go on to Psalm 118, another one which is often quoted in connection uh, with the Messiah. Uh, I'd like to begin in verse 22 in Psalm 118. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. There ought to be a hint there when we see the word salvation, mm -hmm. that this is going to be about the <clears throat> Savior. That's his name. Yeshua means yes. salvation or Savior. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. We need to say something uh, here about what a headstone of the corner was because in our day there might be a little confusion. Today a cornerstone is one of the last stones you put in place in a building. Uh, but these and, were the and, first ones and, so you would lay out. The, the, these, were these are the fun. corners of the foundation and they're the very first stones you put in and you usually would put some kind of, a, of an inscription uh, with those stones saying who built this and why they built it and uh, how long it took and how glorious their God is, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these cornerstones were very, very important in the ancient world. They determined everything else about the building. They determined the, the alignment of the building, you know, north, south, east, west. They determined the thickness of the, of the rest of the foundation, which then in turn determined the height of the building. Uh, it determined uh, if, if, you, if you put in the cornerstone, then that determines that the rest of the foundation stones are going to be lined up on that one cornerstone. So everything depends on that very first cornerstone that, that you in put in whom place. All the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Yeah, you now you, the foundation. Now here you are. <laughs> here you are quoting the New Testament and the way Paul uses. That's great. Exactly. That's the whole point here. And 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 the point of the psalm here is that that stone who is who is going to become the chief cornerstone of the gospel of Jesus Christ of God's work here on the earth. The builders who were supposed to be building the, the, the church of God on the earth have rejected that stone. They have rejected Jesus Christ. Uh, this is picked up again, of course, in Jacob chapter 4 of the Book of Mormon, where Jacob talks about how, the, how he, he prophesies that the Jews will eventually re, uh, reject Jesus Christ. The stone on which they might have built. built for and a, had sure for a foundation. foundation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. For, verse 20, 25 and 26 are. Yes, we need to read those very important. Uh, Christ's triumphal entry into to Jerusalem and, and the people are shouting Hosanna. The Hebrew of verse 25 is Hoshiana, save us now. Yasha, the verb to save, Hosha na, na is the particle of entreaty. Exactly. It means save us, we pray. Save, save us, us, we, we pray. beseech thee. Yes. So this, this is their, their clear recognition that he is the Messiah. And they, they also say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Which immediately makes us think of triumphal entry. Triumphal entry. Yes. Uh, you know, there's, there's another connection. This same psalm ends uh, with a wonderful expression of faith and praise. Um, God is the Lord, in verse 27, and then 28, Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. I'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. And, and these psalms, they're connected once again with the setting up of the temple, aren't they? Yes. And we go to the temple, and that's where we acknowledge him as our God. That's where we praise him. That's where we exalt him. That's where we receive his mercy. That's where we give thanks. And so Jesus is the Savior, but where is it that we best experience that? We, we don't do enough praising in our church, do we? No, but when we dedicate a temple, we do. We yes, don't we? Yes, we do. You know, we, we have the, the Hosanna, Hosanna shout, yes. and sometimes these very passages are associated with that. Yes. Uh, in, in, in regards to the temple, just dropping back quickly to, to uh, Psalm 84, verse 10. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Uh, again, oh, I, l I quote that often. I work uh, five or six hours every Saturday morning in the temple. <laughs> I like that. Now, it doesn't matter what position you have there or anywhere the in the kingdom. Whether you're doing ordinance You're work, doing anything. Be just yes. rather be in the house of the Lord than anywhere else. This has been very exciting for me to discuss these messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. And with a little bit of effort and work, it's relatively easy to see with hindsight these references to the Messiah and to Christ in the uh, Psalms. What I think is even more interesting is to look at those Psalms which are yet in the future, which we have no hindsight yet for. Uh, because many of the Psalms will talk about not just the first coming, but the second coming of the Savior. 
Uh, would one of you would like to bring out some of those? Well, Eric? we've already quoted 22, 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. That didn't happen any time during the Savior's ministry. No. That is a messianic psalm that's millennial. Uh, psalm 67, where all the people are praising the Lord. And then it talks about what it will be like in verses 6 and following. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. All the earth will fear him. These have got to be messianic They're prophecies. Absolutely. Uh, what we have here is prophecy about the entire breadth of our Lord's mission. And of course, we tend to focus on those things about the atonement, about his mortal ministry. The things we know about already. But so many of the things that, that are even mentioned in the Gospels about the, the poor and the afflicted, all of these things will be taken care of when the Savior comes again. And, and often, we, this is all together in the minds and hearts of these prophets and, and uh, ancient writers that uh, whatever the Messiah would do, whenever, like, like in Isaiah, later we have, uh, for unto us a child is born. We know when that happened. That was 2,000 years ago. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's well, that's yet future. Yet. We have the first coming and the second coming in the same verse there. <laughs> but it's all a package, a uh, divine messianic well, package. Well, I think a wonderful passage to end on is 72, 17 through 19. Yes. All nations shall call him blessed. All nations, every nation. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. amen. And thus we amen. come to another session, the closing session in our ongoing discussion of the, New, of the Old Testament. And uh, that's a fitting end for these Psalms that not only talk of his immortal ministry, but of his eternal ministry and of the millennium. There's a lot here for Latter-day Saints to get involved in and to enjoy and to relish the psalms and the prophecies that they contain. And, and speak them aloud. And That's Yes, right. read them aloud. Read they're, them they're, aloud. They're, they're part of your family they're, scripture study and they're, prayer. They're, yeah. they're absolute, bring beauty into your family home evenings with the use of these uh, King James psalms. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, brethren, for participating. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.